Think you know everything about the days of cowboys versus Indians? I mean, Native Americans, not Indians. Anyway, think again, because as they say, history is written by the victors. So the stories that we're told about, yeah, they have a lot of cowboy bias. But maybe it's time to look at things from a different POV. Maybe it's time to reveal how little you actually know. These are 20 unexpected things Native Americans did in the wild, wild west. Number 20. Native Americans use slavery. The 13th Amendment is famous for freeing African American slaves in the United States in the late 1800s. It was a major milestone in the history of the black community in the United States. But here's a little known thing, it didn't free all black slaves. Strangely, some were held in what were known as the Five Tribes. That's the Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw, Creek, and Seminole Nations. These groups were in Indian Territory, now Oklahoma. They were not part of the U.S. at the time. Because they were a separate nation, U.S. laws and amendments didn't apply. Individual treaties had to be made between the U.S. and these Native American nations to free these slaves. It's seldom discussed, but black chattel slavery had been practiced among the five tribes for decades prior to the Civil War. And before the arrival of Europeans, native communities had their own form of forced labor, taking prisoners to work against their will. But this was different. It wasn't generational or permanent. People were primarily taken captive to fill the role of a deceased family member, performing the labor or other duties that the lost family member would have done. Suddenly, I'm not sure if that really compares to European slavery, but that's an interesting fact. If you're fascinated with Native American culture, why not give us a thumbs up and like the video? Stay tuned by subscribing for more amazing tales. Number 19. Native Americans experience higher rates of suicide. Native Americans face higher rates of attempts and completions than any other racial or ethnic group in the U.S. This issue is especially pronounced among Native American teen and young adults. Despite accounting for only 0.9% of the U.S. population, Native Americans and Alaskan Natives are a highly diverse community. With 560 federally recognized tribes, over 200 non-federally recognized tribes, and more than 300 spoken languages, Rates within these communities can vary widely, ranging from 0 to 150 per 100,000 people. While Native American men are more likely to complete, Native American women tend to show more signs, thoughts, and behaviors. Research has looked into various factors to improve prevention, such as relationship support, community engagement, spirituality, mental health care, and alcohol abuse treatment. Rates are twice as high in small rural communities compared to cities. However, these rates can go up and down pretty wildly within those rural spots. Number 18. Indigenous Medicine Wheel The medicine wheel has been a key part of Native American tradition for generations, aiding in both healing and health. This holistic approach incorporates the four directions. Father Sky, Mother Earth, and Spirit Tree, each representing various elements of well-being and life stages. The appearance of a medicinal wheel can vary. It might be a piece of artwork like a painting, or it could be a physical structure on the land. It's believed that thousands of these wheels have been constructed on Native American territories in North America over the centuries. In the context of Native American ceremonies and the medicine wheel, movement usually occurs in a circle, generally in a clockwise or sunwise direction. This aligns participants with natural elements such as gravity and the rising and setting of the sun. There's still debate about the age of the earliest stone medicine wheels. Some have been dated back to 4000 BC, around the same time as the construction of the great Egyptian pyramids. The Bighorn Medicine Wheel, known as the largest and possibly the oldest, might even be millions of years old. Initially, these structures were called sacred circles. The term medicine wheel was coined by non-Native Americans in reference to the Bighorn Medicine Wheel in Wyoming, which was the largest known one in North America at that time. Number 17. Fear, Ghosts, and Hoso Today, there are over 6.5 million Native Americans residing in the United States, spread across 574 tribal nations and villages. 
Each tribe is distinct, with its own historical perspective and customs related to them. For example, some tribes paint the faces of the deceased red, the color symbolizing life. Yucca is sometimes used for washing the body before burial, and feathers may be tied around the head as a form of prayer. Many families also choose to dress the deceased in full traditional attire, including jewelry and moccasins to prepare them for the journey to the afterlife. In the Southwest, tribes like the Apache and Navajo have historically held fear about ghosts, thinking the deceased might harbor resentment toward the living. Among the Apache, quick burials were customary, followed by burning the deceased home and possessions. Families would then conduct cleansing rituals and move to a new location to avoid the spirit of the departed. The Navajo also practiced quick burials with minimal ceremony, and anyone who touched a dead body had to undergo extensive purification rituals. For the Navajo, living in a state of hozo, or universal harmony, is vital. This involves seeing the beauty in all living things and maintaining this balance through specific burial customs. Mourning family members are chosen, who then bathe and dress in special garments. The deceased, along with their belongings and the tools used for the burial, are laid to rest at a considerable distance from populated areas. If the individual in a hogan, a traditional home made of tree bark and sticks, the structure is burned, along with any remaining possessions. This practice is shared by tribes like the Apache, who also feared the spirits of the... Number 16. Native Americans were the first to play lacrosse. It turns out lacrosse is the oldest team sport in the United States. It kicked off with the Haudenosaunee, who were also known as the Iroquois. They played it as far back as the year 1100. These massive and fairly insane matches took place in what's now New York and parts of Canada. Get this, their teams would include anywhere from 100 to 1,000 men. It would be pretty tough to remember who your favorite star player was. They played with balls made of deer hide and wooden sticks. The sticks were sometimes fitted with net baskets made out of deer sinew. There were no defined boundaries. Playing fields could stretch for miles, and the games might last for days. According to Native American lore, the first lacrosse game was actually played by birds and mammals. Back then, players took to the field barefoot and with minimal gear, guided by just a few basic rules. When Europeans arrived, they introduced stricter rules to the sport. However, the Haudenosaunee continued to play ceremonial medicine games aimed at healing the sick. The Onondaga, for instance, have an annual spring game that's open to men of all ages. Each neighborhood has its own take on the rules, and games would often unfold without the use of timers, penalties, or referees. The game underwent a significant change in the late 1960s and early 70s when mass-produced plastic and metal sticks came onto the scene. These lighter, more manageable sticks sped up the game and led to higher scoring matches. Number 15. Native Americans spoke more than 300 languages. Many have tried to quantify the loss, but it's hard to pinpoint exactly how much Native American culture and languages have disappeared over time. According to a widely cited estimate in the Columbia Encyclopedia, there were over 15 million people speaking more than 2,000 native languages in the Western Hemisphere when Columbus arrived. Today, the Indigenous Language Institute tells us that the number of native languages spoken in the U.S. has dropped to about 175. They project that if no action is taken, this number could plummet to just 20 languages by 2050. The effort to preserve and revitalize Native American languages isn't new. It's been underway since the Civil Rights era. To put it mildly, European settlement was detrimental to Native American language and culture. By the mid-20th century, roughly two-thirds of all Native American languages in North, Central, and South America were either extinct or teetering on the brink. Many Native Americans were pushed off their ancestral lands through various means, including treaties and relocated to reservations that were often smaller and more remote. Additionally, from the 1860s to the early 1900s, cultural assimilation was forcefully imposed through government-run boarding schools. In these institutions, children were prohibited from speaking their native languages, wearing traditional clothing or practicing their religions. And believe it or not, that doesn't even begin to get into the atrocity that was those boarding schools. Number 14. The first newspaper in a Native American language. 
The Cherokee Phoenix, the first Native American newspaper in the United States, debuted in New Echota, Georgia, on February 21st of 1828. Using Sequoia's syllabary, the paper was printed in both English and Cherokee. Its name was inspired by the Egyptian myth of the phoenix, a bird that combusts and then rises from its ashes every 500 years. Editor Elias Boudinot, who learned about the phoenix while in school in Cornwall, Connecticut, chose the name, and it's proven fitting as the paper has seen multiple revivals over the years. Funding for the paper's launch came with the support of Elijah Hicks, Stan Wati, and Boudinot's cousin, John Rich, all of whom were tribal leaders. As the paper's readership grew, Boudinot realized similar issues were affecting other tribes. In 1829, he decided to rename the paper to the Cherokee Phoenix and Indian Advocate. A related publication, the Cherokee Advocate, first appeared in both languages on September 26 of 1844. It was printed in the Supreme Court building and ran until funding dried up in 1853. However, it resumed publishing in 1870. Unfortunately, a fire in 1875 destroyed the printing office and its equipment, causing another pause. The paper made another comeback the following year, but eventually stopped publishing for good in March of 1906. This coincided with the U.S. government's move to dissolve the Cherokee Nation's government and integrate Cherokee and other tribal lands into Oklahoma in 1907. Number 13. There are 574 federally recognized tribes. In the United States, the relationship between the government and Native American tribes is both long-standing and complex. The dynamics between tribes and states are always evolving and can involve various elements like formal recognition. States usually recognize American Indian tribes through legislative acts, serving as one avenue for collaborative engagement. Federally recognized tribes generally have access to more benefits compared to state recognized tribes. While state recognition is significant within the state itself, it doesn't automatically result in financial support from either the state or federal governments. Conversely, tribes that have federal recognition often seek state recognition as well. Federal recognition remains the primary route for tribes aiming to gain official status. State recognition does have its merits. It acknowledges a tribe's cultural and historical contributions for one thing. Once recognized by a state, a tribe may receive aid from the state and federal entities. There's a bunch of agencies like the U.S. Departments of Housing and Urban Development, Labor, Education, and Health and Human Services that can step in. These bodies are authorized to support state-recognized tribes. Number 12. Native Americans cultivated many important crops. Christopher Columbus arrived in the Americas expecting to find gold, silver, and exotic spices. What he may not have anticipated was the real treasure lay in food crops, cultivated by Native Americans for thousands of years. An astonishing three-fifths of the world's crops today originated from the Americas. Imagine Italian cuisine without tomatoes, or Indian dishes lacking hot chili peppers. Key staples like potatoes, squash, beans, and corn also came from the New World. Much of the work in domesticating and refining these essential food crops was carried out by indigenous peoples. While European arrivals significantly altered Native American diets and culinary practices, Native American foods in turn had a global impact. Dating back to around 8,000 years ago in Mesoamerica, early inhabitants tamed the wild teocene grass, converting it into a viable crop. The maize grown, known scientifically as Zia maize, wasn't consumed fresh like the sweet corn that we know today. Instead, it was allowed to dry on the stalk and then ground into flour for making tortillas, cornbread, and corn mush. The Pueblo people, native to the American Southwest, were the earliest to cultivate corn. Its introduction to their society around 1200 BC was transformative. By the year 1000, tribes like the Creek, Cherokee, and Iroquois were all relying on corn as a staple food. May seeds made their way to Europe in 1494, and as the Spanish Empire expanded, maize culture reached as far as the Philippines and China by 1550. Number 11. The Haudenosaunee Confederacy The English referred to it as the League of Five Nations, and the French called it the Iroquois Confederacy. However, its true name is the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, meaning People of the Long House. 
founded by the prophet known as the Peacemaker and Iyanawatha, commonly called Hiawatha, the Confederacy's origins are somewhat shrouded in mystery. Because of this, it's often considered one of the world's earliest and most enduring participatory democracies. There's a belief that the American Constitution took inspiration from the Haudenosaunee Confederacy's own constitution. What sets the Haudenosaunee system apart from others is the seamless integration of law and ethics. For the Haudenosaunee, the natural world, society, and legal systems are all on equal footing and play significant roles. The Confederacy initially consisted of five nations, the Mohawks, Oneidas, Onondagas, Cayugas, and Senecas. The overarching aim was to unify these nations and facilitate peaceful decision-making. Each of the Haudenosaunee nations operates through a confederacy to maintain harmony. They each have their own council led by chiefs who are selected by the clan mother. While each nation takes care of its internal affairs, broader issues affecting all nations are dealt with by the Grand Council. Number 10. Not all Native American tribes have their own land. Under the Homestead Act of 1862, land claims were distributed in 30 states. Many of these areas were already inhabited by Native American tribes or were subject to treaties with them. The settlers who arrived often mistakenly believed that Native Americans were all nomadic and therefore didn't make proper use of the land. In reality, many tribes had fixed settlements and even those who were nomadic had specific places they would go to seasonally. Others lived in permanent villages and cultivated their own food. For Native Americans, the concept of land ownership differed substantially from that of the settlers. They considered land to be communal, not owned by a single individual. The divergence in viewpoints often led to conflicts between Native Americans and the newcomers. The Homestead Act accelerated westward expansion, which alarmed many Native American communities. As more settlers arrived, natives were increasingly pushed out of their traditional lands or confined to reservations. Reactions to this intrusion were complex and varied among the Native American population. Some sought new opportunities while others tried to adapt. Some fought to maintain their traditional ways of life. Despite the varied reactions, it was clear that these changes would alter their lives permanently. Number 9. The Bald Eagle the American bald eagle was selected as the national symbol by the Second Continental Congress, but not everyone was on board with that choice. Benjamin Franklin, for instance, he was rooting for the turkey. Can you imagine if the US was represented by a badass turkey? Maybe the F-15 gobbling turkey would be our most famous warplane. Well, it didn't quite work out that way, sadly. That's because the bald eagle won enough votes and became the official bird and symbol of the United States. Before gaining this high-profile status, the bald eagle was first featured on the Massachusetts Copper Cent in 1776. Since then, it's appeared on various U.S. coins, including the quarter, silver dollar, and half dollar. It's worth noting that Benjamin Franklin was in fact inspired by the governance systems of the Iroquois. And even though he didn't get his awesome turkey as a symbol, Americans did end up with something else from the Iroquois because the eagle on the U.S. shield is actually an Iroquois eagle, a significant figure for the Iroquois people. Number 8. Indigenous Totem Animals When large trees like western red cedars are carved, they become what we know as totem poles. These poles are significant in the cultures of various Native American groups in Alaska, British Columbia, and the Northwest Coast. While they're visually very cool, totem poles serve many other functions and their meanings can vary widely across different cultures. Some totem poles function as storytelling devices or historical markers. Each figure carved into these poles helps tell part of a story. Contrary to some beliefs, the figures on the totem poles are not gods to be worshiped. Rather, they represent certain traits or qualities embodied by clans or narrated in stories. Another unique type is the shame pole, carved to publicly embarrass someone who's done something wrong. The shame pole is taken down once amends are made. For instance, a notable shame pole in Cordova, Alaska, featured the face of an oil company businessman. It was said to represent the debt still owed by the company for the Valdez, Alaska oil spill. 
Common figures found on the totem poles include the raven, symbolizing the creator, the eagle for peace and friendship, and the killer whale for strength, along with other animals like the thunderbird, beaver, bear, wolf, and frog. Number 7. Green Corn Ceremony Many Native American communities celebrate the green corn ceremony, also known as busk, annually, to mark the beginning of the corn harvest. The term busk was coined by European traders and originates for the Creek word for a fast, which is putskita. Ethnographers have documented these ceremonies primarily among tribes in the eastern woodlands and southeastern regions of North America. Historically, the ceremony featured a first fruits ritual, where the first green corn was offered in sacrifice to ensure a bountiful crop. Communities across southern North America, including the Mississippians and those within the Mississippian ideological interaction sphere, have traditionally held green corn festivals. These ceremonies are still observed by many southeastern woodland tribes and usually take place between late July and early August, depending on when the corn is ready. The green corn ceremony serves multiple purposes. It's time to give thanks to Hev Zakimez, also known as the breath maker, for the initial harvest. Additionally, it marks the beginning of a new year and it's sometimes referred to as the Great Peace Ceremony. In contemporary stomp dance communities in tribal towns, the green corn ceremony initiates a new year. Leading up to the ceremony, only the ceremonial fire, cook fires, and select ceremonial items are refreshed. By the weekend prior to the big day, people typically start gathering to work, pray, dance, and intermittently fast. The entire festival, including preparation, can last seven to eight days. However, without the prep work, the ceremony itself spans about four days. Number 6. 19th Century Indigenous Woman Warriors In Montana's native communities, warrior roles weren't exclusive to men. While women often handled domestic duties like housework, cooking, and child care, they also wielded significant influence in political and economic matters, as well as domestic and intertribal issues. Some women even broke away from traditional roles and became what can be described as career warriors. We know about these female warriors through various sources, like oral history, expedition journals, and drawings. These accounts come from tribal members, traders, missionaries, and military officers who interacted with them. People who were not Native Americans often found themselves surprised by the women's combat skills, as the idea of women in battle was completely foreign to them. Even male adversaries might have been taken aback, perhaps attributing these female warriors with special or supernatural abilities. One notable warrior was, and please excuse my butchering of this, Kautsuma Nupika, a Kutenai woman who also played roles as cultural guide and prophet. Nupika initially married a French man employed by explorer David Thompson in 1808. However, Thompson expelled her from his camp for being too boisterous. After leaving her husband, she claims to have transformed into a man and subsequently took on multiple wives. Female warriors like Nupika, Quillis, and Woman Chief fought alongside male warriors during times of significant societal change. In more recent history, American Indian women have been eager to serve in the U.S. military, volunteering for every major campaign since World War II. Number 5. Native Americans had diverse housing. Alaska, Canada, and Greenland make up the Arctic region, where Native American groups like the Inuit and Aluit have lived near the Arctic Circle. In the subarctic zone, which includes parts of inland Alaska and Canada, you'll find swampy forests known as taiga and wet tundra. Native American groups there spoke two main languages, Athabaskan in the western end and Algwaquian in the eastern end. California was home to around 100 different tribes, and people there spoke over 200 languages. Many of these Californian tribes had similar ways of life and were organized into small family-based hunting and gathering groups, often referred to as tribelets. In the Great Basin, tribes like the Washoe, Ute, and Shoshone roamed the land. To survive in this area, they had to be nomadic so they constructed small, easy-to-build wigwams, also known as wikiups, from materials like willow poles, leaves, and brush. As for the Great Plains, this area stretched from the Mississippi River to the Rocky Mountains, and from present-day Canada all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. It was one of the largest Native American regions in North America. People living here traditionally reside in teepees, which are a form of Native American housing. Number 4. 
Native American Intermarriage It's tough to pinpoint exactly when the first marriage between a Native American and a white person occurred. Likely, it was between a Native American woman and a white man. Over time, the frequency of marriages between Native Americans and non-Native Americans has increased. Early colonists, fur traders, soldiers, and settlers often married Native American women when they couldn't find women of their own race to marry. Ha <laughs> ha, what a sentence. These mixed race marriages were particularly common in areas with an extended fur trade, like the Southeast and around the Great Lakes. Some states had laws, known as anti-miscegenation laws, prohibiting these unions. Derogatory terms like squaw man and buck woman emerged as a result. As efforts to integrate Native Americans into mainstream European society increased, mixed race marriages became more accepted. By the early 1900s, such unions were quite common and tended to produce more children than marriages between Native Americans. This led some to worry that Native Americans might eventually be assimilated out of existence due to mixed race marriages and varying birth rates. However, as the health of, quote, full bloods improved, their birth rates also increased. Ultimately, marriages between Native Americans resulted in more children than other types of unions, including those with non-Natives. In the early 1900s, the Native American population had dwindled to about 400,000, down from over 7 million in 1492. Since then, the population has been on the rise, partially due to an increased in mixed race marriage. According to the 2000 US Census, about 2.5 million people identified as Native American, and over 1.6 million said they were of mixed race. Number 3. Navajo Code Talkers Created an Unbreakable Code In 1942, 29 Navajo men enlisted in the U.S. Marines and created an unbreakable code. This code was used extensively in the Pacific Theater during World War II, making these men known as the Navajo Code Talkers. From 1942 to 1945, they participated in every Marine operation in the Pacific, including major battles like Guadalcanal, Tarawa, and Peleliu, and Iwo Jima. Using their native language, they sent secure messages via phone and radio, and the Japanese people could never crack their code. Before the Navajo code talkers came into the picture, enemy forces had been successful in breaking all the military codes used in the Pacific. This posed a massive challenge in strategizing against them. Then, in early 1942, someone suggested using the Navajo language to create a new secure code. The first group of 29 Navajo recruits started their journey at the Recruit Depot in San Diego on May 5th of 1942. After basic training, they underwent specialized courses in the Fleet Marine Force Training Center at Camp Elliott, where they learned messaging and radio operation skills. While there, they collaborated with communications specialists to develop the Navajo radio code. Initially, the code consisted of 211 military-specific terms drawn from the Navajo language. As the war went on, an additional 411 terms were added. Since the Navajo language didn't have existing military terminology, new code words with military meanings were invented. So, for example, the term to dina i which translates to sea force, was used to represent ships. Number 2. Indigo and Cochineal Indigo and Cochineal stand out as two of the most iconic dyes from the classic Navajo weaving era. One offering a mysterious blue, and the other a vivid red. Both have distinct histories, but they share a level of fame and significance in the weaving tradition. The term indigo has its roots in the Greek words indicon and indictum, which both translate to from India. This is because until Europeans arrived in America, India was the primary source of indigo. Interestingly, the word aniline is also derived from indigo, but it comes through the Spanish term anil. Indigo isn't naturally occurring on its own. It's the result of a chemical reaction. A green plant contains a colorless compound that produces a cloudy yellow substance. This yellow substance then turns blue when it interacts with oxygen. Number 1. Native Americans were the first to develop and use anesthetics. Native American healers were pioneers in using medicine for pain relief. Indigenous people in present-day Virginia used jimson weed, scientifically known as Datura strononia, to alleviate skin pain. They would grind the root to create a paste, which was then applied to cuts and bruises. To help patients relax or sleep while setting broken bones, healers also had them consume the plant. Additionally, they brewed tea from the bark of the American black willow to address pain and inflammation. 
This bark contains the chemical salicin, which converts to salicylic acid in the body, the same component that makes modern aspirin effective. Native Americans also use capsaicin, a chemical found in hot peppers for topical pain relief. So next time you're getting surgery and you don't scream and writhe in pain as they do stuff to you, thank the idea of all of that pain not being there because you're anesthetized to Native Americans. So what do you think about the amazing Native American culture? What's your favorite fact about these people? Let us know in the comments below. Also, check out our other cool stuff showing up on screen right now. See you next time.